know, so they probably was getting into it. Like, oh, this is me. Oh, <laughs> All right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. You're listening to episode 325 here on Tuesday, October 23rd. This is episode, I said. I think I said 325. We're going to talk about uh, the death of Khashoggi. We're going to talk about Yemen and Saudi Arabia. And we're going to talk about the death of liberty memes first. We'll be back in just one moment here on We Are Libertarians. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to the program, everybody. Again, my name is Chris Spangle, and I am joined here by Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Go good, go good. Better than some people at this table. It's, it's always funnier the second time. That's what I like to say about comedy. Oh, yeah. Uh, we, there was an incident that we don't talk about. Um, I just couldn't believe there were so many people watching. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was watching my career go down the drain. <laughs> so it's all good. Everything is fine here. Um, yeah, I'm going I'm to blame an underling. That's Stone. It's your fault. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Harry Price joins me here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. We're going to be talking about liberty memes here in just one moment. We're going to be talking about uh, the death of Khashoggi over in Saudi Arabia and uh, what that means for America and for the world, and then also for uh, a little bit about the war in Yemen. So uh, please stay tuned. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, Harry's not a Facebook guy, so I'm not even going to ask him because he's not going to say anything. I've been through this before. <laughs> <laughs> just, I just finally, like, remember my login. I had to do all this stuff to log back in. Uh, yeah, and so Liberty <laughs> Memes, I would say Liberty Memes is probably the most famous libertarian page. Like, that's the one that, uh, like, those guys spoke at the Students for Liberty conference. I spoke to them. That interview was in the... Um, it, it was in uh, yesterday's episode, so you can go listen to my conversation with those guys. Very authentic. So someone please tell Mark Zuckerberg, I found them to be very authentic. They're two very nice boys. And uh, they, they run this Facebook page. They're libertarians. And they had 500,000 likes, I think, just sharing memes. And I, I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like many of you, I stole so many memes. Our Facebook uh our, our, our social media manager, mm-hmm. Stone, who runs the Instagram account and runs the uh, Facebook page, he's the one who posts all the memes. So if you ever get memes, please send them our, uh, our way at uh, editor at wearelibertarians.com or just send them to the – post them to the wall on the Facebook page. He'll find them. Follow the Instagram, too. Make him happy. Listen, Stone's 20. He's got nothing going on in life except for We Are Libertarians. <laughs> That's not true. He's a very good boy. And so, uh, so t- you know, he's just sitting here posting memes all day, and, uh, you know, a lot of them are from Liberty Memes because those guys are the OGs. They are the uh, the Michael Jordan and the LeBron James of memes in the libertarian movement. Uh, I said it, and I mean it, and I stand by it. Not those old washed-up memer- memers like the Larry Johnson, a.k.a. Aaron Ewart of memes. Uh, <laughs> remember Larry Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, cross-dressing on the weekends. Uh, so I see Aaron doing that. I shouldn't. I shouldn't make fun of because Aaron just saved me. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, so liberty, liberty memes. It was only a matter of time. So many of you know that back a long time ago, roughly two months. Remember that uh, mm-hmm. two two months ago when Alex Jones was the hot topic of the day. I consistently said on this uh, on, on this program and then on this uh, Facebook page to which we are streaming, I said to the everybody, listen, you need to pay attention to this. If you go to a restaurant and you get bad food, you have a right to complain about the service. It doesn't mean that it's a violation of property rights. 
yes, it is their their prerogative to have on whomever they want to be on their platform. But Alex Jones, as you pointed out, it starts with the hackers, mm-hmm. then it goes to the sex workers, yep. and then it goes to the conspiracy theory mm-hmm. theorists, yep. and then now it's just come to mainline libertarians like mm-hmm. Liberty Memes. Correct. You know, punk rock libertarians, I would count in that. They had their stuff pulled. Uh, the, the guys uh, from Free Thought Project, you know, they would they would post some stuff that was out there, I would, I'll admit. But, yeah. uh, you know, same with Alex Jones. Like, But at the end of the day, everybody has a right to say what they want to say. Correct. Because when you, let's say, let's take 9-11 truth, for instance. People think about 9-11 truth. And then some people actually say that stuff out loud. And then other people hear it and they go, I disagree with that person. I'm going to write a book for popular mechanics refuting all of the stuff that they said. And then everybody has double the information because we're talking amongst each other. And so if you never allow people to get into the public square and say certain things, then you never have the ability for the conversation to build over time. And what is happening at Facebook and in Silicon Valley is that they're they're like everything. Special interests like the Atlantic Council and these big think these big uh, foundations like the Annenberg Foundation, which is dedicated to social justice and environmentalism, which funds Politifact. You know these these groups are are the elites, and they have their preferred vendors of news of information. It's CNN, it's the New York Times, it's the Washington Post, and as George Carlin said, it's a big effing club, and you're not in it. And uh, what has happening in, in Silicon Valley is that they're kowtowing to those groups. They're kowtowing to the media elites and the Washington elites. And at the same time, the liberals that are working within their own company, the SJWs, who uh, don't want libertarian and conservative voices to be on the platform. And there is a, a stronger level of organization on the left than there is on the right. Things like Media Matters continually tracks. Uh, news from, you know, Repu- Republican outlets mainly, and then basically gives talking points to the Sunday talking shows. And uh, so w- what we're seeing is a crackdown. Uh, there were some, there are always some token left pages that are cracked down, but by and large, you're seeing right pages. The first round in August, it was legitimately Iranian networks that were, were taken down. And so what they do is they, they find they have targeted a certain behavior, and they say if, if one account runs multiple pages, and then if, let's say, we are libertarians share something, and then my personal account shares it, and then the five pages I run share that post, then Facebook considers that to be terroristic behavior. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're influencing elections. And so what's happening with these pages is these, you know, people like the guys that run Liberty Memes probably run several pages and share their content. Now, what they're doing is they're trying to rig the algorithm to benefit their page. They're doing what any social media marketer does. They're just doing it for politics. Like it, This is standard practice amongst the crowd that does social media marketing. And so all of a sudden it's a problem when it's, when it's politics, and that is because... You, you have two factors that are happening. You, you have first, the media is angry at social media and independent media for two reasons. First, social media stole their revenue. Newspapers were totally cannibalized by social media advertising and Craigslist. And so it is the, it is the thing that they blame for their uh, cannibalized revenues. So if they can run a story that will actually hurt social media while hurting independent media, which is, number two, competing for eyeballs with them, Correct. then they're all for it. And so that's why they have run with this story. They have, you know, the Oliver Darcy's of the world are continually trying to punish these guys. And uh, it, it, is, it is the elites and the left cracking down on libertarian and conservative voices. And I told you that it would be Alex Jones first, and then it would be us. And we're heading that direction. I will be amazed if this page that you're watching this Facebook Live video on exists by 2020. Uh, so it is, you have to understand, it's, they, they go after an Alex Jones or an Iranian network first because you're not going to defend them. You're not going to defend an Alex Jones and, oh, but he's a conspiracy theorist. Or I'm not going conf- to stand up for these anti-vaxxers. And so by getting you to stay silent... 
that it, you're basically being complicit in the censorship of these platforms. And again, it's their right to do it as companies, but it's also where the public, Facebook and social media are the modern coffee shop. It is the modern beer hall. This is where public conversation takes place. And the libertarian voice is being diminished with, which, with every single round that is happening. And so if you're not being a good consumer and complaining to Facebook and making a noise about this, uh, then you are basically complicit with communists. You are, you are standing silently by while the people you, – you will be the last mouth, mouse to squeak. And then your voice, when it's time for you to say, you know what, all the stuff that I like on Facebook, all the points that helped libertarianism grow over the last decade, if you've been a libertarian like I have since 2008, nobody knew the word in 2008 when I became a libertarian. Now everybody knows the word, and it's right. because of social media, and it's because of organic growth. And so it is, it is every libertarian's duty to start standing up for these pages. I'm a, I actually got added to a group today with a lot of these, uh, these page owners that got banned, and we're going to start working on something. I'm going to go to some of the other libertarian podcasters, because what I would like to build is a, a, a network, essentially, Mm -hmm. So that when one of these pages goes down, we swing a big hammer that drives people right to those news pages. You know, Liberty, Liberty Memes 2.0, somebody, if you, uh, hey, Stone, I know you're on there watching, Paul, if you guys could grab the new Liberty Memes Facebook page and put that in the comments, I'll put it in the show notes, go like Liberty Memes new page and like their Facebook group because it is important to show Facebook that you can knock a page down with 500,000 likes but it's up to like 40,000 already. Uh, so we have to show these companies that we have power, that we have power in numbers. And so when one of these pages goes down and the owners start something new, then we immediately populate something new and we pop right back up. Because if we don't do that, if we don't show that we have strength in numbers, then we're just going to continue to shrink. Uh, I want to, let me see if I can find this uh, video here. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where it went. In my in my panic, um, there was an incident. Nothing ever. We're not talking about it. Uh, we're never to speak of it again, Harry. Correct. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I had all this stuff queued up, and then in my panic, I shut it all down. It's okay. It's okay. It's understandable. Yeah, and it's crazy to watch because you've watched different like some pages like insulate themselves. Like Al Jones always try to stay in this lit as much as possible and there's because uh, like yeah even free talk live has abandoned facebook right you know they have but see here's the thing about alex jones is alex jones is the white wall yeah all right he, because alex jones has had 20 years to prep for this mm -hmm. and so free talk live alex jones you have to understand it well liberty memes built their platform on facebook I, you're right yeah, which is why we're a podcast. We're we have an email newsletter. We have a Facebook, a Facebook group, multiple mm -hmm. groups. We have a website, mm -hmm. uh, and it costs a lot of money. Which is why you should be a Patreon of this program and other shows that you support because it takes a lot of money to have multi platforms. It cost Alex Jones millions of years to have satellites. It costs Free Talk Live a ton of money to run LRN.FM and mm -hmm. some of the things that they do. So go and donate to Free Talk Live and some of these other guys that you love and support. And so what Alex Jones did is Alex and Free Talk Live are on radio stations. They're on satellites. Right. But these groups haven't stopped at removing Alex Jones from 20 platforms. They've gone after his credit card processors. They've taken his PayPal. They've gone to his suppliers and bullied his suppliers. You can no longer buy Super Male Vitality because they've taken his suppliers from him. These people are out to end us. Yeah. And there comes a certain point where you have to stand up and you have to wake up and you have to go, I understand that these companies have a right to do it, but I have to make sure that my voice still is – there's nothing dangerous about the libertarian message. Right. There's nothing that we are doing that is, that is uh, terrorism. And we're at a point, as Cody Wilson says, where when you start talking, uh, speaking in terms of the arguments that Thomas Paine made in American court systems, you're considered an extremist. And so I really find it un-American what is happening because what, what Liberty Memes was doing is they were sharing the, the 21st century political cartoon. These guys are 21st century pamphleteers, mm -hmm. and they're talking about libertarian principles 
and foundational principles that this country was founded on. And if you don't want their voice on your platform, then we all have to go, are we going to do business with you or not? Nah? Right. And part of me has said, I don't want to do business with these people. I'm going to pull us. I'm going to end our group. I, it, it'll hurt our business to not have the group. It'll hurt our presence to not have a Facebook. It'll. But do yeah. I want to do business with these people? And you know what? Somebody in the group rightly called me a pussy. And they said, no. If you give up on these platforms, if you stop popping up and stop uh, – like, and so I think we have to have the attitude that, that Stone and I have adopted now with the We're Libertarians Facebook page. It's like, we're just going to have fun, and whatever happens, happens. If they steal our Facebook page from us, whatever. You know, like, if they take those 90,000 likes, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. You know, we've got other platforms. But you have to realize that it doesn't just matter that they've, they, they're they they going to come after our credit card processors, our Patreons, our everything, unless we start networking together and organizing and fighting back. And I don't mean fighting in uh, a fisticuffs type of way. I'm saying by standing up for what we believe in. So uh, <clears throat> this is one of the founders of Liberty Memes. This is uh, Dadman. Um, I don't know if this is admin one or two, but uh, this is what he was up to last night when he found out that their page was taken away. Suddenly the news came through that our page is fuzzy. It's like cloudy, unfiltered IPA. He's drinking a beer. Anyway, it has been a rough friggin' day. I was out going door to door for Young Americans for Liberty, for a Liberty candidate. And the connection was really spotty because I was out in the countryside. And suddenly the news came through that our page had been zucked. And that was very infuriating because they didn't tell us why. So I logged into one of my accounts to try to arrange a backup with some of my old pages that I have for backups, like Dank Liberty Memes, um, to... Uh, add new admins to those pages and 20 minutes later the account that I used to admin those pages got deleted for posting something as innocuous as a meme of Hillary Clinton eating Tide, Pod, Tide Pods and this was like the post had been on my page for maybe two three maybe even longer two three years and they deleted it and banned my account that I was using to it. The, the first post that you guys saw today from Dank Liberty Memes, that was from that account. All right. <clears throat> so I'll stop it there. But uh, yeah, that is that is the Liberty Memes saga. They are back up. They've got a big page. We'll put it in the show notes. Make sure you go follow those guys. Even if you hate memes, which I don't know why you listen to this show if you do, uh, you're going to want to go follow those guys. So uh, yeah, I, ju I just think it's really important to to start standing up for your friends and allies, and I think it, it, I think we're in a moment where we need to put aside a lot of our, our inner squabble differences, and we need to start realizing that there's a group of people out there that want to destroy the libertarian message and destroy the networks that we've spent 15 years building, and it's time for us to say enough and start working together, networking together, and build... Uh, a system of rapid action. So when one of us goes down, we're we're right back up, and we're right back where we were, and 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 even stronger. So I'm going to be working on that, and I hope that uh, when we roll some of that stuff out, you'll be, you'll participate. Yeah, which is like the thing you've got to do. You've just got to work on getting away from these platforms now because of they did a great job of getting bringing people together and showing people the power of the internet. And it's almost kind of sad because I've actually seen a lot of people's like skills have like. You know, went bad, went, went awful. Back in the MySpace days, people were learning how to code websites. You know, you had to if you wanted your website, your your uh, MySpace page to look amazing. Yeah. You want that special font. You wanted that thing. Well, look up. You're learning cascading style sheets and HTML. Yeah, I think we're heading back to the age of the blog roll. Yeah. Yeah. Email, email and website like go go download our email every day at nine o'clock you get an email from us that uh announces all the new podcast and posts from we are libertarians.com and the we are libertarians network go get on that email list i have the rss feeding to it so we have something going out and so it's regularly sent you know we're regularly emailing you mm -hmm. uh but go get on that list for us please just go get go get on the email list 
It's it's super easy to sign up. You will not miss it. I've got it everywhere. And that's because we're trying to build a backup. We're trying to build a backup way to communicate with you so you know what's going on with us. Uh, go like our page C first so you see everything that we share first. Go make sure you're make sure if you're listening to this you subscribe to the podcast. So a lot of people only a few thousand of the several thousand I can tell subscribe to the show. Because when we post, we have a certain number. We have about 3,000 in the first 24 hours that download the show. Mm -hmm. So I can tell those people subscribe. But then over the course of a year, we have five to 10,000 more people on top of that, that that download it. So subscribe to the show. That, that, that is a surefire way. This is, this is the product. We are here. And uh, so until some leftist screecher tries to take our podcast uh, host from us, then we'll, we'll, we'll be doing this. First and foremost, everything else is just a cherry on top. Yeah. Everything else is just to drive you to this and to raise awareness of the podcast. So if you haven't subscribed, please do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and we have a Discord. Yeah, we, and the Discord channel. Now, granted, like, uh, those are other channels that we don't have. And, like, don't worry. Like, we are working other things on the back end. And the other thing with the email thing is because if we do end up going down for some for some reason, the email is a great way to tell you where we're going. So if we go down for, like, you know, something happens to the hosting site, we do go down. You know, Nice will get us back online somewhere on some junky server in Russia that he's probably picked up. And, you know, and you've gone to know the link. Yeah. <laughs> And that's right. how we're going to send it out. All right, let's jump into the Khashoggi death and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is... People forever have talked about the Israel lobby, and there is definitely a Saudi Arabia lobby at play, and um, we'll explain who some of those people are. And uh, the reality is that the Saudi Arabia lobby is much darker because it, it breeds much more death around the region uh, than, than, than Israel does. Um, we sell a tremendous amount of weapons to the Saudi Arabians, which then bomb children and men, women, and children in Yemen. And uh, we'll kind of give you some more details on that. But uh, let's talk about the state of Saudi Arabia. They're one of the few monarchies left in the world, and uh, it is run by the Salem family. And um, it is, it's is—it's been around for about 80 years and this is from King, this is an intercept article called Kingdom Crackdown and it was written right and posted right around the time that uh Koshagi was was in my estimation murdered i mean there's just there's no body let's be honest um and, and i posted this article when it first came out on October 6th because it talks about the Kingdom Crackdown on women rights activists and you didn't hear anything about it, but there's been a liberalization that's been taking place in Saudi Arabia, and it has been uh, halted over the last few months. And women, women's rights activists are now starting to, to be disappeared. But then all of a sudden, one journalist is disappeared, and it's all over the news, and we've been talking about it for roughly two weeks now, for more than two weeks. And I have to, I have to ask you to ask yourself why we're hearing so much about a missing journalist. Uh, but we're not hearing about the women's rights activists. We're not hearing about the dead children in Yemen. And it's because major media outlets only cover stories dealing with themselves or their agenda. And here are the agenda items of the mainstream media ranked. First, number one, it's protecting freedom of the press and ensuring that we all understand how brave they are as a profession. And so if, if there is a story that tells how dangerous it is to be a journalist, usually it's overseas and it's somebody who, who's never set foot in America mm -hmm. that's brave, even though this guy wrote for the Post. <clears throat> but um, they want to tell you how brave they are as a profession and how they're under attack. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would think that Trump disappeared this guy. Yeah, as much as they're doing it and bringing Trump's name <laughs> into everything, it's, yeah, it's like Trump ended up doing this. This happened at the White House. Right. Because he keeps saying mean things to Jim Acosta. Like, you watch the rallies. Like, they all, they all intonate, it's never been this dangerous to be a journalist. But when you watch those Trump rallies, and I've been in the media bullpen at a Trump rally, when he points to the back and says, and those, there they are, the dishonest media. And everybody turns around and laughs. Mm -hmm. And they go, boo, with a smile on their face. It couldn't be less intimidating. But they turn it into a big story because they want to appear brave. Yeah. It's, it's the most self-important 
it, it's right up there with with teachers and cops yeah. in terms of self importance. And I think they like it too because it gives them the excuse to actually put themselves in their stories when they're told never put yourself in a story. Exactly right. Uh, I remember uh, one reporter on 9/11 being chastised. She was she was nearby, and after the towers fell, she she teared up at that moment mm -hmm. when the towers fell, and she realized how many people had just been killed, and she teared up, and people were just. How could she put herself? The, the journalistic, uh, I was in journalism class at the time, and like so I watched the trades, and it was, how could she make herself part of the story? Oh, if they could only see Jim Acosta now. Uh, you know, number two on the hit parade of things that the media will actually cover, writing any story that supports the narrative where right-of-center politicians and activists are dangerous nuts. So if somebody who is right-of-center, and I would, I would, I include libertarians in that because they include us in that. Right. So we may not think of ourselves on the right-left spectrum, but people on the right, left, and the media all consider us right of center. Correct. Like you just have to accept that that is the reality in their minds. Uh, and <clears throat> so any story that makes uh, like people who are on the libertarian or conservative side seem crazy, they will do that. So you remember how uh, for all of those years, like when Joe, what's his face, uh, Joe, the the congressman. He screamed from the balcony, you lie. Um, and every yeah. politician for a month after that, it's so heated, uh, congressman or senator or politician on the right. Do you agree with this level when Trump, you know, oh, I'll pay for that guy's bills. Do you agree with this? Mm -hmm. But no no liberal politician has ever asked, do you agree with uh, uh, Eric Holder that we ought to kick them when they're down, when they go low? You know, it's, it's it's different rules for for left and right, and everybody. the The beautiful thing about Trump, and I will give credit to Tad and Rob Kendall and even Greg to those people to those guys. They were totally right about the effect that Trump would have on exposing the media for what they are. Number three of the uh, narratives that they will cover: um, any story that allows them to get close or a retweet from their left of center idols. So if it's a leftist politician like Beto O'Rourke, you know, you're just such a superstar. Even though you're down 10 points, everybody loves you. <laughs> Stop trying to make Beto happen. It's not going to happen. If they, can, if they can get a retweet from Rosie O'Donnell, then they'll do it. They just squee a little bit. Everybody's just, uh, you see the way that they are in a circle around Hillary Clinton. And they're all just, oh my gosh, Hillary, you're so funny. And then this look of disdain for uh, Gary Johnson or Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, number four. Businesses that stole their revenue streams need to be regulated and controlled because of quote unquote Russia. They gaslight and bully these companies into compliance. So a social media company and they they will they will sit there in front of Jack Dorsey and go, uh, "Do you agree with Alex Jones inciting violence?" And this stuff works. Somebody said the other day, you remember when Glenn Beck? I said, "You remember when Glenn Beck talked about the coming insurrection?" and how there were going to be these uh, socialists and black masks on every street. And then he talked about how the count there, the, that Muslims wanted a caliphate and the Wahhabists were trying to form a caliphate. And then ISIS happened. And then somebody was like, don't you remember when Glenn Beck tried to incite violence? I go, that never happened. The dude was on the steps of the, the memorial in Washington, D.C., going, you should love everybody. You know, and so there's there's just these these narratives that take place that are planted in people's minds that are started at media matters that just it, people buy wholesale. Number five, media outlets that stole their views or ratings must be closed so that people were to return to only seeing news from them. They'll cover endlessly Facebook shutting down news outlets or Alex Jones. Those are really the only things that they'll cover. They don't cover war. They don't cover anything that doesn't benefit those five narratives. Correct. And so when a journalist it, that uh, they have hobnobbed with for the last decade and has been the Washington darling for the last two, one to two years that they all are friends with is disappeared, then it's a major story. They don't care about the poor people that are being bombed by the thousands with American bombs in Yemen. They don't care about the, the, the women's rights activists that are being disappeared in Saudi Arabia. They only care about their friend and it validating the narrative that journalism is dangerous and Donald Trump is dangerous. And so I find this to all be kind of ridiculous. I, uh, I am I'm sorry to the Khashoggi family, and I am sorry for what happened to him, and it certainly is newsworthy. But is it a month's worth of news when you give zero coverage? <clears throat> Somebody uh, 
did some research for us. I'm not going to give their name because they don't want me to give their name. But um, when they're when we're talking about Yemen, mm-hmm. um, here's how serious things are in Yemen. A, a, a crisis started by the Saudis and Barack Obama and continued by Trump and, and the Saudis. Uh, children in particular have been affected with as many as 400,000 at imminent risk of starvation in Yemen. In April of this year, UN General Secretary Anto- Antonio Gut- Guterres said that 8 million people in Yemen didn't know where they were getting their next meal. It's a catastrophe on scale with with Syria, but coverage in the U.S. has been sporadic at best. The PBS NewsHour did a thorough three-part series, but MSNBC, for instance, has barely mentioned the crisis in a year during a period when it has done 455 segments on Stormy Daniels. That is uh, from media reporter Adam Johnson. The reason for inattention is obvious. The United States bears real responsibility for the crisis. A quote from a Yemeni doctor found in the P- in the PBS documentary sums it up. The missiles that kill us, American-made. The planes that kill us, American-made. The tanks, American-made. You are saying to me, where's America? America is the whole thing. Uh, so, and that was from the Rolling Stone. Uh, this will be in the show notes if you want to read that article. So you you actually laughed at some coworkers today mm-hmm. about this. Yeah. When I had some coworkers talking to me, trying to get my information, because I have now become, the, you know, that political guy at work, the libertarian. Go ask him. Right. You know, ask him what's going on or ask me about information. So they brought it to me about, like, this whole Khashoggi thing and about, like, see what happened. And Trump doesn't care about, like, you know, this reporter. And my, and my brain's just like, no, 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 no. Like, you can't say that he doesn't care because... I, I, then I started bringing up all these other times that reporters have been killed. We've got, you know, proof. And that United States weapons have been involved. A lot of you guys probably wasn't watching at the time when WikiLeaks drops collateral murder. That's the reason why Chelsea Manning was put in, put in prison. We're releasing that when we um, had an Apache helicopter shoot. Um, the United States shot down Reuters reporters overseas. Right. We... Um, when um, Barack Obama oversee the uh, U.S. military and they did a drone strike on an actual U.S. citizen, didn't care then. No one gave no one gave a damn. Double tapping a wedding, still don't care. Well, we've got this lone reporter now because we don't like the president. Now this is a story. This is a story we can run with for weeks. Right. You know, so it's to me it was just more like how dare you? How how dare you drop this at this guy's feet? You know, that happened in foreign soil in a foreign embassy, had nothing to do with it. And then the thing is, out of all the murders that probably happened in this country, that's nothing. Especially something in Saudi Arabia. This one murder, you think this is the reason to pull out? This one murder gets you? Exactly. That's what's got me. It's like, this this, this one murder, not the other atrocities. These, this one murder. Not no, 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 one murder. This is the problem. Now, oh, come on. They've murdered people, murdered hundreds of people, you know, just like you were talking about the report, the Saudi women missing. OK, I remember reading that and being sh- you know, like like flabbergasted and going through all these different Saudi cable stuff. It's really hard, difficult to read because, you know, he, uh, you know, the translator's awful. But like, no, this is a drop in the bucket. This is a Tuesday. Yeah, this is how it works. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about. Uh, l- listen, you're you're going to hear you read a lot of the same stuff. And uh, you're going to get some of the same facts that you get other places, but we're going to give you a much more in-depth analysis about what's happening in Saudi Arabia than you're going to get other places. So get ready for the fire hose. Um, but this uh, Intercept article, which is usually good on foreign affairs, on on domestic issues, <laughs> it's a hot garbage can of trash. Um, so, so they write, In 2016, under the leadership of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he is, he's about 35 years old. He's about our age. Mm-hmm. But uh, he's acting for his father, I believe, who is fairly incapacitated at the moment. Um, Mohammed bin Salman, who we will refer to as MBS because everyone el- else does. The Saudi government has embarked on a massive Vision 2030, 2030 campaign for national transformation, promoting vast social and economic reform, including expanding rights for women. Never before had the government traditionally yoked to an ultra-conservative religious elite broadcast such a zealous message of reform. 
Yet at the same time, the government was increasingly censoring civilians of various political and religious persuasions, arresting critical clerics and moderate journalists alike, and placing increasing pressure on state media to publish pro-government stories, sources inside Saudi Arabia told The Intercept. Hiba Zayedin, the Human Rights, Human Rights Watch's chief researcher on Saudi Arabia, said the state was making clear that all the promised reforms were to be accomplished by the state alone in a top-down manner on the government's terms. Uh, and essentially what they talk about in this article is that when it was announced that women would have the ability to drive, the women's rights activists who really pushed for this were ordered not to post on social media so it would look like MBS got the credit, not them. Right. He didn't want to encourage any kind of protesting. And, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is important for a couple reasons. They are, first and foremost, the central bank of oil, essentially. And uh, they, they are – the Saudi royal family is in charge of keeping Mecca and Medina in order, the two most holy sites in Islam. Now, uh, they are a Sunni majority country along with Egypt, Turkey, and Syria. And they generally oppose Shia majority countries like Lebanon, Iraq, and Iran. And so MBS has been trying to, as we as you know, we fought Iraq, and then as we have turned Iran into enemies, Saudi Arabia tried to be very helpful, uh, and they essentially saw an opportunity to carve out, you know, favor with the United States government as we went after Shia countries. And uh, if you don't know the difference between Sunni and Shia, it, it comes from a split between. Uh, right after Muhammad died, uh, around uh, I think Muhammad lived around 600 AD, and uh, and the there was um, the, there was a dispute as to who would take who would carry on the line, whether it was his family or if it was his chief deputy, and the chief deputy apparently made some comment in front of one of um, Muhammad's wives, and so she was very she, very vengeful, and that's she was the the orchestrator between the split between Sunni and Shia. Uh, and I think that, um, man, I, I I can't tell you with certainty, but I know that's the story, whether I think it was the Sunni who were the deputy and the Shia who were the, who were the family of Muhammad that took over. Uh, so that's kind of a, a rough, <laughs> a real rough sketch of what happened in that divide. And that's shaded politics in the Middle East ever since. And the reason that you have Turkey playing in this story is that Turkey sees an opportunity to, even though they are as well a Sunni majority, they are part of the original caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, the you know Constantinople and Istanbul, as it was renamed. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the head of the Ottoman Empire. And so they're trying to reestablish the Ottoman Empire under Erdogan. And obviously Saudi Arabia is, an, is a competitor, Turkey and... Turkey and Iran have kind of a loose um, agreement along with Russia in Syria to fight together on behalf of Assad. And then we're fighting with uh, the rebels and Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Israel against Assad in Syria, although much of that is starting to wind down now in that civil war. Uh, it's moved to Yemen, where the uh, Shia, backed by Iran, are trying with the Houthis to establish a foothold in Yemen, uh, south of Saudi Arabia. And so what Saudi Arabia does not want is to be surrounded by Shia countries. Uh, up on the northwest border is Iraq, uh, and then down it would be Yemen on the bottom. But as they, even though they've tried to reform under MBS, they've still kidnapped Lebanon's prime minister, essentially, or, or foreign minister. Uh, they've cut off Qatar. They have uh, backed this war in, in Yemen. So they, they are still, you know, not, not great actors. They're right. still bad actors in the region. Yeah. Yeah, it's still that, you know, same type of old school, you know, like medieval stuff that, you know, we've read about in books. They're still doing it. Yeah. You know, this is like, the, the reason why it's so shocking and jarring is because, you know, most you know, Western countries stopped acting like this, you know, over 50 years ago. Right. So they, they, they uh, also, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the, the royal family is in charge really of the tone and tenor of most of Islam because of the two holy sites. And MBS has really promised uh, more of a, a de-emphasis on Wahhabism and toning down the Muslim Brotherhood and uh, trying to, 
um, make Islam more nice, make mm-hmm. Islam nice again. And uh, they, but despite that, he has run into a lot of problems with the youth. Uh, I think it's the the number in here is staggering. Uh, it's like seventy percent. We'll we'll come across it and I'll I'll mention it again. But it's like seventy percent are, are under thirty. Roughly seventy percent of the Saudi population is under thirty years old and tend to be particularly receptive to the promises of the vision of twenty thirty. But there's still a large Wahhabi contingent. This is the birthplace of Wahhabism, the birthplace of Saddam or uh, Osama bin Laden. This is the birthplace of the hijackers on 9-11, mm-hmm. the Mujahideen. Uh, so this is still a very radical place along with Egypt. And uh, so as a result, less than two years into the government's 24-year plan to reform the kingdom, positing as a progressive peer among the world's liberal democracies, the frontiers of Saudi descent have shifted almost completely abroad. So despite this promised liberalization, people who are critics Mm -hmm. of MBS and the Saudi government are fleeing. Saudi Arabia, one of the world's last remaining absolute monarchies, has never offered much in the way of civic engagement. Even so, the kingdom has seen numerous, if marginal, movements for political reform in the course of its 86-year history. Since at least the 1970s, academics and organizers, many of them women, have quietly nurtured a network of salons using private homes as gathering places for political and intellectual discourse. The first mass demonstration for women's rights to drive came in 1990 when 47 women drove cars in the streets of Riyadh. More recently, a smaller collective, uh, such as the Jeddah Reformers, uh, the Saudi Civil and Political Rights Council, or the Union for Human Rights, or, and the Adela Center for Human Rights, emerged to promote civil rights and government accountability. They talked about the drivers in 1990 and, and that, and how they were uh, shunned in, for, for these women who chose to dro- drive. The state severity is all made the more terrifying by its arbitrary enforcement. Saudi Arabia lacks an official constitution, relying instead on a dif- diffuse and malleable constellation of religious rulings, fatwas, alongside royal decrees. For most of the kingdom's history, the penal code has been likewise ad hoc, allowing the state to prosecute activists and dissenters as they saw fit. So, uh, could you imagine, Harry, mm-hmm. a world where people just arbitrarily censored voices that weren't friendly to the government and just without rhyme or reason pulled down their facebook pages could you believe could you imagine a world like that oh no no of course not there's no way we could do that and have to go to you know like back alley salons you have to get (laughs) your own or back alley salons to get your information get my information and like or have to like smuggle podcast cds at you know at the gym right (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh Got that wall? Got that wall? <laughs> hey, hey, bro, you got any wall? <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, sorry, I was just looking for text messages. It's like no wall. I got some tad talks though. <laughs> I'll fresh out, fresh out of tad talks, man. I got some of that boss hog. No, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> got enough of those. Try to get rid of those. I got a backlog of those. I'm all right. Yet, while the state has always been intent on suppressing political protest, the past several years has been a severe turn. In 2008, subject to pressure from American anti-extremism efforts in the region, the Saudi government established a specialized criminal court tasks, tasked with prosecuting terrorism causes. Soon after, rights groups began raising concerns that court was being misused to prosecute nonviolent dissidents. Could you imagine, Harry, a world mm-hmm. where secret terrorism courts were being used to prosecute political dissenters? Hmm. So they have special courts, right? Right, that are only accountable to the government. They're only accountable to them. Nobody right, knows right. about. And no one knows about that. And those. they use those to uh, crack down on people who are anti-elite. No, that's, now, that's, that's, that's crazy talk. See, that's, that could um, never happen here. No. That could never happen mm, with, mm. with uh, bullshit FISA warrants against the Trump yeah. campaign. FISA warrants or, like, you know, like if you ran websites or stuff. Yeah. That never happens. So in, an ar- in, a, in a paragraph that I swear was probably written, and then they had to add an addendum because he went missing, because Khashoggi was somebody that was frequently quoted by the press— even independent press, by like the Independent. Uh, and so here is, here is what he uh, has to say. The growing atmosphere of fear prompted some to leave the country, include, including Jamal Khashoggi, a Saudi journalist and former newspaper editor, who said he began facing scrutiny after publishing articles in favor 
of the widespread popular uprisings known as the Arab Spring. The government made it clear they weren't happy with me then, said Khashoggi, a 59-year-old. <laughs> Just wait. Uh, Jetta native whose penetrating eyes had grown weary in recent months. We spoke several times during the summer of 2018, his decisive voice edged with remorse. There was always a gentleman's agreement between the state and the media. We published certain things, kept uh, or kept other things out of the press. It went along smoothly. But then we started seeing more direct pressure on journalists only to publish pro-government stories. Some people were asked to sign loyalty pledges. Some people were banned from writing or had their columns taken down. Things got worse for activists, too, or people with critical opinions. The government was sending a message that if you're not with us, you're against us. Khashoggi re relocated in June 2017 to the U.S. Um, his colleague also moved. Could you imagine a world, Harry? <laughs> I, I'm just, this is crazy. But could you imagine a world where um, all of a sudden the government started uh, cracking down on independent media outlets by forcing uh, lo independent media outlets to start uh, removing dissenting voices? Could you imagine a world where that happened? I, I could imagine that, or the loyalty pledges or licensing, if whatever you want right, to call it. Yeah. Sorry. Uh. <laughs> That'll never happen here. Oh, don't you think that Jim Acosta would jump at the chance to get a government official license from the United States saying he was a journalist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. We love having an, an official license. He tweeted out with pride that he had a, an official license from the mm -hmm. government saying he was a journalist. Yep. I'm an official journalist. Got to have your license to do that. Yeah. So that's the loyalty pledge. That's right. And then that's coming. You just wait. They will do that. Within the next 10 years, I promise you there will be licensed journalists. Oh, that's, that's Guess who will not be getting licensed journalist cards? I'm I'm gonna assume Mittens. <laughs> mittens would get one easy. Okay, I'm sorry. That she's trust me, Mittens is pro dictatorship. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, that's the one cool thing. Like, um, I'm sorry to go off track, but like Free Talk Live did that a while back with saying like, hey, if uh, you send in shows or you know send in money to Free Talk Live, we count you as a, as a uh, producer. So go ahead, use that if you need to get a. Uh, Free, uh, like press tickets. We should do something. So we should start sending out official licenses mm -hmm. to our patron members, people who send us stories. We should start licensing journalists. We are libertarians journalists. Mm -hmm. Just license them. Yep, Just nice little it. laminated cards. We could probably pick up a nice light, uh, like laminated car printer and just print them out. Yeah. Start printing some licenses out. We'll look into this. This would be great. I'll put that on the trailer board. All right. <clears throat> Yet the Saudi state's efforts to suppress dissent appear to extend far beyond the nation's borders. Numerous Saudi activists who sought refuge in the United States and Europe have reported receiving phone calls from Saudi embassies in their host countries. The call w included requests for activists to report to the embassy for undisclosed reasons. I would never go, said one activist who received one, su one summons. Who knows what would happen? I'm afraid they would deport me. Since 2015, three Saudi princes who criticized the royal family also disappeared while abroad and are believed to have been forcibly returned to the kingdom. Such fears were surely on Khashoggi's mind on October 2nd when he approached the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. Khashoggi was seeking documents necessary to marry his Turkish fiancée, Hiat Hatis, who requested that her last name be withheld. According to Hatis, before entering the consulate about 1.30, this is one of the first outlets to report it. That's, this was, again, from, like, October. Gosh, I think this was, like, October. Man, I, th I said it earlier. But this is one of the first stories that really kind of talked about this. Um, waiting after midnight, he never reappeared. Um, so we'll cover more of that in a minute. Today, the Saudi streets are awash with a heavy mixture of hope, bewilderment, and for some, a burgeoning patriotism. Most Saudis agree with varying levels of excitement or dismay that their country is living through a moment of profound change. Now, I listened to a podcast today. It's called Intelligence Matters, and it was with Norman somebody. I've put it in the show notes. And he just got back from Saudi Arabia. A lot of really insightful stuff about Khashoggi and Saudi Arabia in this podcast. And he basically said the same thing that this article says. So there's two, uh, two witnesses to the Saudi street here. A message the government itself aggressively promotes. State-sponsored billboards, street signs, and social media campaigns tout slogans of national pride and the promise of Saudi Arabian renaissance embodied by Vision 2030. Um, 
MBS has presented himself as the architect of the kingdom's promised renewal since about uh, announcing Vision 2030 in April 2016. He has rapidly consolidated power, undercutting traditional governing protocols, firing dozens of government-appointed officials, and directing abrupt changes in the economic, labor, and religious sectors. Some of the changes have reversed decades-long conservative norms, such as the decision to allow women to drive and attend sporting events or the opening of cinemas and concert halls. Seeking to encourage a more diverse and engaged local workforce, the Crown Prince has overseen programs to incentivize companies to hire Saudis alongside new policies to curb the country's massive migrant workforce. Uh, they are they are talking about futuristic robot cities. There there is a Davos in the desert that is taking place right now in Saudi Arabia. They are investing heavily in Silicon Valley. One pillar to Vision 2030 is the rehabilitations of Saudis uh, the the Saudis image abroad, which has long suffered from associations with religious extremism. MBS continually goes out in the press, and he's constantly hobnobbing, trying to. Uh, to show people that they're different now, he said, we won't waste 30 years of our life combating extremist thoughts. We will destroy them now and immediately, he said. Uh, in keeping with his promise, the government has silenced many of the country's conservative religious figures, most notably in a spree of arrests last September that include several prominent clerics, uh, and scaling back the religious police. Uh, one of those under 30 folks said, for the first time in my life, I'm proud to be a Saudi. My whole life, I've had to bear the burden of 9-11 whenever I travel abroad. That was what we were known for, but now suddenly it's cool to be Saudi. But bef behind the carefully curated optics, MBS's execution of his agenda has upended the kingdom's distributions of power. Quote, The king has always been the most powerful person in Saudi Arabia, but he's always ruled through a complex system of mechanisms and councils. Basically, see, see graft. So the way that the Saudi system has always worked is through patronage. If you're a critic, we'll just go and pay you off. If you are acting in, you're not acting correctly, we'll just give you money. We have this oil money, we'll spread it around. And that's what made the Saudis always different than Saddam Hussein or some of these other monarchs or dictators that rule these countries. That's why Saudi Arabia survived the Arab Spring. It's because they had so much money flowing into the pockets of these local councils and politicians and even dissidents that they were able to keep control of the country because they kept everybody well fed and they gave them money. Yeah. And so the, this is a radical shift towards something that is not good. When a person who is – there's no such thing as a benevolent dictator. When somebody like this starts to consolidate power and does it through terror, then that is a really bad sign. Yeah, it's um, one, also one of the things um, talked about in the Declaration of Independence here is that the reason um, humankind will, you know, will, I'm trying to think of the phrase and say, say it correctly, but all those bad actions that they were doing, they made it sufferable with the, so you could suffer through it. You know, it's so, so bad. It sucks. All these rules suck, but you see my Ferrari? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So <clears throat> so essentially, he's centralized power in every major sphere of life into his own two hands. He has control over political, religious, economic, oil, military, social media, everything. He controls the levers directly or indirectly over every dimension of life, says a professor at the American University of Beirut at uh, Harvard. So with this, he, he adds, with this type of top-heavy rule, there is no room for political or civil discourse. MBS doesn't want any accountability. He has made that clear. He wants to be 100% in charge of the narrative. Unlike his predecessors who have consistently jailed activists and dissenters, MBS is now present preemptively locking up those who might in the future oppose him in some way. This new sense of vulnerability has all but halted any grassroots movements for reform. So here was a country who had a lot of promise in... in uh, grassroots freedom movements, and those are completely stifled now. Um, there is a resistance that is uh, starting to be built up outside the kingdom. Some Saudis are attempting to consolidate a resistance, a constellation of college students, exile activists, academic bloggers, human rights advocates that work to keep the issues of political repression in the eye of the international community. The government is waging a PR battle, and so we are attempting to do the same, one of them said. Um, so, you know, he, he is 
not the great reformer that he is made out to be. He is somebody who is consolidating power in Saudi Arabia. And the elite in Washington, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Atlantic Council, all the people who are in charge of telling Facebook who is and who is not an extremist, all of these people are completely enamored with the guy. And they all love to do stories about what this, this great Saudi liberal reformer. Meanwhile, he's consolidating power in a way that Mubarak did and the way that every tin-pot dictator has done in the Middle East over the last hundred years. And so that ends really badly. And when Saudi Arabia descends into the chaos of Syria or Iraq, that's really bad because it's really big with a lot of resources and the holy sites. And so the war over Saudi Arabia, if the uh, kingdom falls, not good. <laughs> uh, it's going to be real bad. So there is a vested interest in the Washington elite who, who see themselves as the controllers of destiny for these poor, unfortunate souls who are born in such a hot place. They have a vested interest in making sure that uh, these people are supported as well. Uh, and a big reason is money. So... The the biggest reason, you know, Donald Trump said, I don't, I don't want to be too hard on the guy because we've got a hundred billion dollars worth of of uh, goods here. You know, we've got we've got a billion dollars in in uh, arms sales. Correct. Uh, let me see if I can find exactly what what he just sold to them. He wants to keep his deal. Trump is a transactional president. He doesn't want to risk the sale of a billion dollars. Here's what we're selling to Saudi Arabia. This is from uh, March 2018. Uh, on the Al Jazeera, the package includes $670 million deal for 6,600 anti-missile tanks, a $106 million contract for helicopter maintenance, and $300 million spare parts for the military vehicles. So this is a this is a big thing in the military. Spare parts. Every here's what you want to. It doesn't matter. You you can sell the tanks. You sell the tanks cheap up front. Because you want to beat the Russians or the Chinese for the tanks. Because you want to sell the parts. So you sell 25% margins on the tank and 300% margins on the parts. And so that's a huge, huge part of arms sales. And so, you know, Trump doesn't want to disrupt. Uh, it, you know, he doesn't want to be too aggressive with these guys. Right. Because we've got a billion dollar deal on the table. You know, I don't want to lose jobs in Seattle for Boeing. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got babies to kill in Yemen. We can't. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, here, so. we got troops in Northern Africa that needs a supply. Oh, sorry. <laughs> big, this is, uh, this will be in the show notes. These are the 20 defense companies that donating the most to American politicians. The 28 midterm election will be held on November 6th. At least through September 24th, defense contractors have donated $22.9 million dollars to federal politicians and political parties. Um, while the defense industry contributions are substantial, they are many times smaller than the financial sector, which leads all financial contributions with $554 million in contributions. Um, so, you know, it goes all the way up. It's Rockwell, DynCorp, you know, they, they make parts, they make helicopters, Coburn, Leonardo DRS, you know, these monitoring systems. Cubic, which makes the F-35, General Electric, uh, which sells parts to the Navy, SAIC, L3 Technologies, which is communications, Leidos, uh, Huntington Ingalls, BAE, Harris Corp, United Technologies, General Dyna Dynamics, um, which makes a variety of combat and land vehicles, Lockheed Martin for the Air Force, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman with $3.5 million. Uh, so you you're never going to get these politicians who love this money to actually start cracking down on the people that are actually buying these you, you, those contributions stop if you are a congressman that has Boeing in your district or Northrop Grumman. That's the thing. We're selling arms to kill people, right? And we want to stop because they killed one person. <laughs> now I think all is a horror. It. All right, I want, you, I want that known right there. All I'm saying is just let's just let's, you know like. Let's really explain what we're talking about here. I think the murder, that's awful. Selling arms so they can go murder, also awful. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly right. It, it, the one life, because he's a journalist, his life is not more worth more than the child who died, the 55 children who died 
<laughs> in the school bus bombing with American bomb parts. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's Let's, where we add on this thing. Yeah. 55 we're, versus one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're outraged at the others. Like, okay, we see that, but there's other bodies that are stacked up there. Like, there's other reasons it's to stop this deal than this one. Stop hammering on this one murder. We get this. Right. But there's so many other things we can put on the scale that also on reason why this deal should stop. Yeah. Exactly right. Oh, man. All right. So let, let, let me give you the details of the Khashoggi case. Okay. All right, because we're going to give you a full overview. So if you've heard this guy, na- this guy's name a million times, you kind of know he went into an embassy and he didn't come out. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to give you all the details, like we always do, and then we'll give you our our uh, our phony opinions. Mm-hmm. But what we try to do here is we try to give you the facts, we try to give you the whole context, and then we give you a range of opinions so you can choose what you think is the most likely, and then I tell you what I think. Because right. I'm not the arbiter of truth. I'm just a fat kid sitting in, in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Reading a bunch of stuff, so uh, I try to make sure that uh, you know everything. Um, so, uh, so who was Khashoggi? So Khashoggi was a longtime member of the ruling elite of Saudi Arabia. This cannot be lost in all of this. So yes, this is a guy who fought for reform. But you know how when somebody dies, all of a sudden, all the bad things that they did in their life completely disappeared, and all of the gross parts kind of disappeared, and all the good parts get you know, put up there. Like, we ignore the guy that, we ignore the, you know, we don't talk about the uncle who cheated on his wife. We just say, you know, he really donated a lot to uh, Rupert's kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so that's kind of going on with Khashoggi. What you have to understand is that this guy was, he was at the side of the foreign minister for forever, um, Fareed Zakaria, who who hosts GPS. I actually had to watch Fareed Zakaria this weekend for you people. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, yes, I watched two hours of Fareed Zakaria for this show. Don't tell me I don't I don't bleed for you people. <laughs> um, and he talked about ten years ago when he went to Saudi Arabia. Khashoggi was the person who was funneling him in, and Khashoggi's main job was he was putting the lipstick on the pig that is the Saudi government. He was the one who was networking with Western journalists when they would come to Saudi Arabia, or when he was traveling over abroad with the foreign minister. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. I was, like I had my th- thought. I wanted you to finish because the whole thing is like, and it's the reason why. Like, he, all right, he thought something was bad was going to happen because <laughs> he's probably seen bad crap happen. Yeah. It's like this seems like a setup. This is the problem with with poor Khashoggi. He knew too much. Yeah, he knew too much. He's like, wait a minute. I've seen this. Yeah, I've wrote. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen how this works. I know how this is going to work. So this is a guy who who was a he was head of a newspaper, and then he wouldn't publish a piece about the Muslim Brotherhood, and then he was asked to leave his post, and then eventually, a couple of years ago, he left uh, in exile and started to say not nice things and things that were critical about MBS and the uh, the kingdom, specifically last September in a column. And so here's a guy who was, uh, you know, his last column was basically uh, about how there needs to be freedom of the press, and there's not freedom of the press. And so he he was a reformer. And here's some of his good points. Let's give you some of his good points. Let's let's admit that he was complicit, or at least around a lot of atrocities, uh, and and basically was the head PR man for the Saudi government for a period of time. But here are some of his points. People can change. They can change their beliefs, especially if they've seen totalitarianism. Right. Um, this is uh, put together by Hody. Hody Johns, our researcher, doing a fantastic job, along with Sarah and Paul, on the Wall Daily. Make sure you give them some love. If you listen to an episode of Wall Daily and love it, please give them some praise. Uh, that is their compensation. That is their pay. Uh, they are doing an excellent job, and I'm very, very pleased with uh, the work that Reinhold and uh, Hody are, and, and all those guys are doing. Hody's working his butt off for this audience, and uh, so is Sarah and Paul and Reinhold. So make sure you give them some props, unlike some people at the table. <clears throat> Mittens. Mittens is in the other room. So uh, so the Washington Post and, and, and Hody, right? So here's some of the good points. He att- attempted to reestablish Islam as a nonviolent faith. He frequently wrote that the pillars of and tenets of Islam don't de- denote violence, and that the violent—excuse me, 
I, th- I think that was a sign um, <laughs> of what? I have no idea. Um, I had to take a few uh, activated charcoals. Mm. You ever get the uh, acid reflux? Yes. Yeah, I, now I, I'm getting old, yes. I don't very often, but when I have act- acid reflux, I don't take the Zantac. I take activated charcoal. Okay. And it and it cleans all that acid up. It's, it expands and it binds all the toxins, and it's very good for you. Are you going to turn this into a uh, commercial for My Magic Mud? <laughs> Get our uh, <laughs> exclusive activated charcoal right now at wearelibertarians.com slash store. <laughs> 25% off. I know I'm insane. Uh, <laughs> just want to make sure this is where we're going now. Uh, so, Khashoggi pointed out that before 1979, both Muslims and even the Saudi government rejected Wahhabism for hundreds of years, meaning violent Muslims today are being co-opted by political players and not simply being obedient to their faith. I'm sure that got a few nice emails in his inbox. He was a critic of Saudi Arabia's blockades and fixing of oil prices. He asserted that driving up costs on exports made only the wealthy rich and that putting embargoes on the other countries resulted in embargoes against his own country, which penalized the poor. He is most notably credited with his campaigns to give women and men equal rights. He successfully ended a ban on female drivers. At the time of his death, he was close to helping end male guardianship, a set of laws that forbid women to leave the house without either male, a male escort or a man's permission. Um, you know, Reason writes, Americans should be gravely concerned with this assassination. Rand Paul tweeted, This so-called explanation from the Saudis is not even close to credible. What they did was unacceptable, and I call on my colleagues in Congress to join me in denouncing their behavior and changing how we treat them. He also called on ending foreign aid, and I could not agree with him more. Why are we sending Saudi Arabia and the oil, the central bank of oil for the world, uh, foreign aid? Right. Since we sell arms to Saudi Arabia, there's a chance that he was killed with guns that we sold him. Even if not, his death emphasizes Saudi Arabia's violent intentions, that they will kill someone who poses a risk to America, giving them weaponry. Also, he was a critic of the Saudi government living outside of the country, so his murder scared critics worldwide. And this is a really great point. So we, we refer back to that Intercept article. So as, as I told you, I listened to the Khashoggi case, Intel veteran Norman Rule on implications for Saudi Arabia from the Intelligence Matters podcast, former acting director of, I think, the CIA, hosts this podcast for CBS. And they were talking to this guy. And, and so this intelligence guy was basically saying, this doesn't make sense for the Saudi Arabians. Because the Saudis, they don't have any kind of recent history of engaging engaging in assassinations bro- abroad. Correct. They rendition people. So they don't do what the Russians do. So what, what Putin does is Putin specifically kills people in a very violent and gruesome manner by poisoning them abroad. First, mm-hmm. it tells those countries, I have the ability to kill someone within your country. It tells dissidents, I have the ability to reach you wherever you are in the world. And when I do reach you... I'm going to poison you to death. And so he consistently kills dissidents in this way. The Saudis don't do that. They rendition people. So what they do is they just kidnap you and take you back to Saudi Arabia and do whatever they want to you there. But they don't kill you. They just put you in prison. And so, you know, no Saudi officials have been relieved at this point. So he says that doesn't make sense if it if they had he was kind of under the impression that they didn't do it or that they they something got out of control he was kind of buying the explanation that this was just a fight gone wrong or a rendition gone wrong and mm-hmm. he ended up dead because he's saying they don't have a history of assassinations they do renditions no officials have been sacrificed prematurely uh third this was an amateurish operation i mean we know so many details as you'll hear about this assassination uh and for the Saudis have been given strong warnings that cannot be repeated, and this investigation must be a real one. Trump has talked to them. Pompeo has talked to them. Uh, they, uh, uh, Gina Haspel is currently the, the director of the CIA, is currently in Turkey helping run the investigation into what happened to this guy. So the Americans have made it very clear that this ought to be a serious investigation or else. And... Uh, you know, Trump seems pretty favorable, so does Jared Kushner, to the Saudis. And so I have no faith in Donald Trump being tough on the Saudis whatsoever. I just don't. And I think that, <clears throat> you know, him saying today this is the most botched cover-up in history. 
Like that's that's from a, him. That's what Donald Trump said. Yep. What kind of what kind of caper was this? <laughs> yeah, it was awful. I'm sure you guys had to do murder. When Donald Trump, this is Donald Trump. So I said this in 2016. Here's the problem with Donald Trump being president. He's going to let slip details of security briefings that we're not supposed to know. Right. Now, fortunately for all of us, or unfortunately, Donald Trump does not read the briefings. Did you know this? Do you? Yeah. Trump does not actually read the security briefings. He has someone tell them to him. Mm-hmm. Um, no, no, <laughs> they're already tailored to for the president to see what the security agencies want him to see. But then it's an extra layer of, yeah, let's just leave this part out. Dumb you know, down. It's like when I'm reading these stories, I'm like, ah, skip that paragraph, move on to this one. Um, and so, you know, Trump going, it's the worst cover up in history. Mm-hmm. Wonder what that guy knows. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it was awful, sloppily done. Um, Obviously, you know, Amherst, the Clinton Foundation is probably looking at it like, amateurs. Yeah, honestly, Hillary could have done <laughs> such a better job. <laughs> if she were running this like she ran the Benghazi op- operation, yeah, and like, the way that she killed Christopher What's-His-Face, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no fingerprints on that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Got to let him walk in. It's like, first off, they had cameras? Oh, come on. <laughs> and that body double? Oh, come oh, on. Dude, dude <laughs> wait. Wait. Until, this is this is the Keystone Cops. Let me, yeah. let me get into this. Sorry, okay. sorry, sorry. You know the whole Donald Trump of uh, I'll see it when I believe it. Okay, well here's the evidence. This is this is crazy. Uh, so, so why would they want him dead? You know he he is somebody that um, if if MBS ordered the death of Khashoggi, it is a signal to every dissident around the world saying I'm going to take some international heat for killing this guy, but he's the most well connected of all of the dissidents. He is the person who is most he's writing for the Washington Post. He's in every news article. He is he knows too much. And so let's take him out and every other dissident in the world is going to shut up because they're already getting the phone calls. They're already they already know what's up. And so this is MBS basically like Putin saying, I can reach you wherever I want in the world. And if you come anywhere near any of us, you will be killed if you are a dissident. Um, So that is one possible explanation. So uh, no one has done more to sway the public opinion uh, about or against, really, Saudi leadership than Khashoggi since he left. So let's go to the timeline. So September 28th, um, this is from Quartz. Uh, September 28th, Khashoggi, a Saudi citizen, moved to the U.S. last year, visited the consulate in Istanbul, Turkey, to collect a document he needed in order to marry his Turkish fiance. Hatis Singh, uh, there's a pronouncer, Jang, Jangjiz. Jangjiz. Yeah, there we go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Hody, for the pronouncer because you know I can't pronounce anything. Uh, when he was told he would need to return, he later arranged to come back on the afternoon of October 2nd. Now, Erdogan in Turkey, who, as I told you, has no love for the Saudis, and they are in a, a, an arms race with Iran to essentially be the 800-pound gorilla head of the caliphate in the Middle East. Uh, and so Erdogan has said that between September 28th and October 2nd, he said today that there are manifests that show that there were planes from Saudi elite circles and basically implying that killers came in, so they knew that he was coming in on the 2nd. Mm. And so when he came in on the 28th, they said the 2nd's the day. Uh, but I... I <laughs> Here's the thing. When you read that the Turks and Erdogan, specifically who jails uh, journalists, Andrew Brunson, a, um, an American pastor, was just freed by the Turks because he was arrested in Turkey. These people have the same record now. The Turks at one point were liberalizing and disgusting, being discussed about putting in the EU and NATO. These people have the same track record and attitude towards journalists and dissidents that the Saudis do. So... Take everything with a huge grain of salt when you see what Erdogan says about this. Um, so, on October 2nd, Jengiz waited near the consulate while he went inside to retrieve the documents at 1.14 p.m. He had instructed her to get help if he did not reappear. After a couple of hours, when he had still not returned from what should have been a routine visit, Jengiz rang the police. Turkish staff at the consulate home on the day of his disappearance. Turkish staff 
inside the Saudi consulate were told to stay home. Um, the, in the early hours of that morning, Saba reported a private charter plane carrying nine Saudi officials and intelligence officers had arrived in Istanbul from Riyadh. Around 4 p.m., six vehicles left the consulate carrying Saudi officials and intelligence officers. Two vehicles went from the consulate to the Saudi consul's residence and remained there for the next four hours. So he uh, told his fiance that uh, if he did not return to call the police and then call someone who is very close, a very close advisor to Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey. And uh, that's exactly what she did. And she also word word spread pretty quickly that this guy was that he was disappeared. Now, there's been a story out there that there's audio of this. And so there's very, very detailed explanations of what happened to him. <clears throat> you know, that he was um, he had his fingers cut off and then he was given a drug and then he was decapitated and he was cut up into pieces and put into bags and, you know, carried out of the consulate in a suitcase and that they had bought bags and that there was audio of all this, and there was screaming, and you know, classical music was playing for the other staff in the other room. People were told to leave the room. Uh, very detailed things. And so anytime you have a story like this where you have such detailed facts, you kind of have to go, eh, there's a lot of level of detail here that's really like, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe oh, this is okay. true. I mean, you, it's, it's when it's light on facts where it's like the Christine Blasey Ford. We don't, you know, there's kind of light on facts. Mm -hmm. Not saying it did or didn't happen, but there's not a lot here. So, but there's a lot here. Now, the uh, allegedly the way that we have an audio recording is that he gave her his two cell phones, and he turned on his Apple Watch to record no sound, right? And then went into the consulate, recorded the death, his own death, and then the thing uploaded the audio to the cloud. Now, here's the problem: Turkey has LTE, but they do not have LTE Apple Watches. So Apple Watches are not supported by LTE and wireless signal in in Turkey. Okay. It's possible he had the Wi-Fi and he knew how to turn the Wi-Fi on on the watch and he had a brand new watch that connected to the Wi-Fi without the phone, but the reality is the phone was too far away for Bluetooth to work on the phone, on the watch. Right, I have been told that the ACLU has a secret app that, or has an app that you can put on your watch that will record and then stop recording if something happens and automatically upload it. I have not verified that. So I find the Apple Watch story to be a little fishy because I have no idea how that would possibly work. He would have to have the Wi-Fi for the Saudi consulate. I don't think that was the thing that was on his mind. <laughs> Maybe it was. So, I don't know, you're the tech guy. But to me, the thing you have to understand about consulates is embassies are the most bugged places in the world. The Oval Office has bugs. Like, every embassy around the world, these are stations for the spies operating that country to come back to their home base. And they operate because it's foreign soil. So if you are on, in the Saudi embassy in Turkey, you're on Saudi soil. So if you're in the Saudi embassy in the United States, you're technically inside Saudi Arabia. You were governed by Saudi Arabia's laws. That patch of land is the other country's safe space. And so 10, peop 10 countries all said that this guy was dead and missing. Yeah. How'd they all know? Oh, I don't know. Maybe they had it bugged. Now, it's illegal for them to say that they had a recording of this because they had bugged the consulate. So they had to come up with some cockamamie iWatch story. So I'm sorry I don't buy the iWatch thing. I don't know. Um... All right, a couple of things, right? Now, these are rabbit holes. You know, I'm going to have to get the conspiracy board out. Okay. All right. One, knew this trap was going to happen, talked to someone in Turkey, and they gave him the Wi-Fi password to the consulate to get on, right? Okay. All right, and so that thing was attached to Wi-Fi, updating. That's one thing. Okay. All right, that's a, that's a conspiracy. That's him having not only the knowing and knowing of these people, then knowing this is going to happen, okay? Right. A lot of ifs. Probably didn't happen. Or... Other if, right, is that he did have an Apple Watch, right? And then he got just some Russian hacker guy or somebody. Really? Is that your damn... Is the coffee maker again, right. sorry. Um, got to some Russian, and they made the device, the iPhone, just talk to an LTE tower. It's not that difficult. 
Yeah, but the app, the iWatch, doesn't doesn't talk to the LTE tower though. Why? That's what I'm saying. Why wouldn't it? It doesn't in Turkey. Why? Because the Apple, the device in Turkey is not supported. So, but do they? This is from Apple's website. I looked. It doesn't up matter. Like if you can, it it's more of a. It's just not supported, right? They don't support that. Doesn't mean that you can't make it talk to it. It's the same radio frequency. I just don't get the vibe that Khashoggi was you and could make that work. I'm just not buying. That's it. true too. I'll give you that too. But I mean, like I said, he could hire a Russian that did that. They attached it to it. He hired Q. And Q came out. <laughs> da, 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 da. Or, or it's not an Apple Watch. The they, mo- me- they messed up. It's an Android watch. You know. The more logical explanation is that the Turks are lying and had it bugged because they're, they're uh, enemies. <laughs> no, no. I'm sure it's going to turn out that uh, Khashoggi was a super hacker and he did. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Um, so... On October 3rd, on what should have been his wedding day, Reuters reported his disappearance, and questions began to circulate naturally. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman told Bloomberg uh, the Saudis would cooperate fully with the investigation. We are ready to welcome the Turks in to search our premises. The premises are sovereign territory, but we'll do whatever it takes. Uh, The next day, October 4th, Turkish sources reported that the country's foreign ministry had summoned Saudi Arabia's ambassador to clarify where Khashoggi had gone. The ambassador allegedly told Turkish officials he had no information about Khashoggi's whereabouts. The Saudi government gave its first official statement on his disappearance via its official news agency. Um, they said after he left the building, uh, the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, the statement said before confirming that the country would carry out further procedures and coordinate with local authorities to find out where he'd gone, but he'd, they didn't know where he was. Foreign media outlets later reported that Saudi officials had said that he had left the building via a back entrance. Uh, so the Saudis flew in. Uh, I, let me see if I have the guy's name. He was part of that crew mm-hmm. that flew in. Uh, yep. And I don't think I'm, I don't think I have it. Um, I, I I posted it today, but you can see. They had this guy who was a lookalike, yeah. who was part of the uh, the government, and he looks kind of like him, but not enough like him. Mm-hmm. And so they went into, they they like took his clothes in a plastic bag, went with this guy into a bathroom. He came out wearing his clothes, Khashoggi's clothes, and walked out the back door. And he he there's video footage of him now that was released today that I'll put the link in the show notes. Of him walking around, just do do loop do loop, and so the Saudis said, "Yeah, he left. We got footage of it." And then when they showed the footage, it's not the same guy. It's clearly two different people in the same clothes. Um. Well, obviously, uh, that guy rolled a one on, <laughs> on his disguise roll. Okay, he failed miserably. <laughs> so October seventh, the next day. Uh, They dismissed the reports that the Turks could have anything to do with this. The statement claimed that a security delegation of Saudi investigators arrived in Istanbul based on a request by a Saudi government official. We we always protect all of our citizens. Now, on October 8th, Jonathan Swan, who works for Axios, is kind of one of the hot new reporters. He's the one that everybody – he has all kinds of scoops all the time. So if, like, you want to scoop, you want to get something out there, you're – running for president and you want everybody to know first to go to Jonathan Swan or Maggie Haberman or Jonathan Martin, one of these people, and you give them a scoop. And so Swan gets a text message, a, a WhatsApp message from the Saudi ambassador to the U.S., Prince Khalid bin Salman. Uh, that last name probably sounds familiar, doesn't it? Denying any allegations ag- about the Saudi governmental involvement in Khashoggi's disappearance. I assure you that the report that suggests that Jamal Khashoggi went missing in the consulate in Istanbul uh, or the kingdom's authorities have detained him or kill him, killed him are absolutely false and baseless. Swan thanked him and asked whether there was footage of Khashoggi leading, leaving. Uh, Swan said that he never replied to that. <laughs> and that's sort of the, the biggest clue here is there's no body. He's not been found, so he's the world's most important missing man. He's he's not been found. I know, and it's technically not a murder until you find a body. So the eighth is when everybody, when the Turks told 
people that he was killed in the consulate. Uh, the next day, October 9th, uh, the president of Turkey asked Saudi Arabia for evidence that, as they claimed, Khashoggi had left. So they all kind of knew about this footage. And I'm guessing that they had talked about it inside the consulate on the wires. Mm -hmm. And so all these intelligence agencies from all these different countries all knew that they had put this ruse together of him walking out. And so that's why everybody kept asking about that footage. Um, so the Justice Ministry and the Turkish Chief Prosecutor in Istanbul um, started an investigation. And that's when we really started to find out about uh, you know, some of the gory details in this crew coming in. Uh, was nearly a week later. Um, that's when his uh, fiance said, release the tapes. Let's see the CCTV footage from the consulate. Um, later reports said they were focusing on a black Mercedes that was leaving, that they think uh, th this caravan had him in it. Uh, so after they, they basically stop... Um, uh, they on the tenth they sort of go well maybe those tapes are on <laughs> somewhere in Saudi Arabia along with the body, um, so they have CCTV. Basically, what everybody is saying is there's there's CCTV on there like you don't have a consulate and not have closed circuit security cameras. We here at We Are Libertarians headquarters have security cameras. Okay, I have a lot of equipment around here, right? Yeah, and so there is security cameras. They turn off when I come in, so I'm, you know. Eventually, we'll have one pointed outside on the um, yeah. cars. Yeah, that would have been helpful <laughs> had I uh, bi directional one. I wish I thought I saw you driving around the other day, but that you know that Chrysler had uh, r rims and tires. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Then this is where. So th they're basically saying like. You got footage running inside this place. We all we all have cameras inside of everything. Release those tapes. And they said uh, we we don't know where the CCTV footage, where the security camera footage went. United States police officers do it all the time. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry, my body camera turned off. I uh, must have hit the button. Could you mm. imagine, Harry, living in a world where the security cameras just malfunctioned when something bad was happening? Can you imagine that? Oh, I'm just going to turn this off. I'm so thankful that doesn't happen here in America. Yep. Um. So. Trump weighs in on the 11th. Um, Trump says he wasn't an American citizen, and the events took place in Turkey. So basically, F him. Uh, <laughs> like, this guy was a permanent citizen. His children are Americans, but, eh. And uh, he had spoken to Saudi officials. We're probably getting closer than you might think, but I have to find out what happened. He probably did not his friend request on Facebook before it, he was. Exactly so. right. Uh, October 12th, amid mounting speculation that Khashoggi had been killed in the consulate, Saudi officials released two statements. One, the false accusa accusation circulated in some media on the Saudi government and people against the background of the disappearance of the Saudi citizen Khashoggi. Uh, it claims that the journalist had been killed were lies and baseless allegations against the government of the kingdom. Uh, second statement... Uh, announced a bilateral investigation between Turkey and Saudi Arabia, but it's an unnamed official. Uh, so it did not acknowledge requests for footage that had been requested. Uh, with pressure from the international community growing on, on October 14th, another Saudi official spoke out against them, ag out against threats and attempts to undermine it, and basically said, the kingdom also affirms that if it receives any action, it will respond with greater action. And as Hody puts in the notes here, a common tactic when you're touching on the truth and it hits a nerve is when they threaten violence against anybody who questions them. Um, <clears throat> so here's where it gets good, Harry. On October 15th, all right, so we're now how many days out? You know, Khashoggi is killed on the 2nd. Correct. And so we're now on the 15th. An Al Jazeera video appears to show a cleaning crew armed with supplies descending on the consulate. Because people are taping the consulate now. Well, cleaning day. On the sixth, not <laughs> unusual. Uh, on the sixteenth is when we find out that his body was cut into pieces, uh, according to CNN. The night before, Turkish officials had searched the consulate for nine hours. It had recently received a fresh coat of paint everywhere inside the building. Convenient. Convenient yeah. that they had to paint. They had. Listen. You could they had the porter paint guys scheduled for the 14th. There's, it's just a coincidence. Coincidence. Listen, Sam, 
Sam the paint guy, he could he couldn't reschedule. Turkey's a lot of paint, a lot of fresh coats of paint in Turkey, right? Yeah, <laughs> just fresh coats of paint fresh, all over the country. Fresh coat, it's it, it was it's, already scheduled. Right, it's something we have to do. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can't we can't reschedule this. Sam's great. Mm-hmm. It'll take us nine months before he gets in here. You can schedule this guy again, right? That's that's well, what? Huh? Uh, in an interview with the AP, Trump raised the notion of rogue killers, and then compared him to Brett Kavanaugh. You know, here we go with a, you're guilty until proven innocent. I don't like that. It's, shut up. <laughs> Just shut up. Trump has been so ridiculous through all of this. It's awesome. Uh, on the 17th, Pompeo visits Turkey, where he told reporters that he and Trump had spoken to the crown prince. Uh, he made clear that the Saudis had cooperated with the investigations that the Turks are engaged in. Um so <laughs> it is always a good sign when you let the accused parties assist in the investigation. Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. Don't look under that bush. Here, I'll look under it for you. <laughs> Thank you. So helpful. <laughs> right. No, no, so no. helpful. Uh, wow, look what I found over here. Oh, I just tripped and f- spilled this plant on this uh, evidence. Ooh. I like that can you imagine that? I like that we're inter- turning it into Inspector Clouseau. Can you imagine living in a country where they get to investigate themselves? <laughs> I couldn't imagine living in that hell. Uh, God, what would that be like? Investigate themselves. Uh, it's crazy talk, right? Turkish plans to search the Saudi consul's residence fell through after, quote, the Saudis claimed that the consul's family was inside. Uh, we have said that before that the Saudis must cooperate. So they couldn't come in and do the investigation that day because Aunt Donna was visiting. You know, we can't. Aunt Donna's here. We can't let you in today. She's got high blood pressure. You'll you'll startle her. Star. That would be bad. Um. So after speaking with three unnamed Turkish sources, CNN reported that Khashoggi had died after being interrogated in a mission organized by a high-ranking Saudi intelligence officer. A New York Times article described how Khashoggi's killers had severed his fingers and later beheaded and dismembered him, according to details from audio recordings described by a senior Turkish official on Wednesday. He is alleged to have died within minutes. Uh, again, that's I, I, th- I think it's just clear that's from a bug. Uh, that sen- Saudi intelligence officer, the mm-hmm. Houston Chronicle, I believe it was, found a photo of this guy with... Uh, MBS when he visited Houston earlier in the year. Uh, Saudi government official released another statement. Um, just said this is all misleading campaigns. Uh, so on October 19th, they finally admit he's been killed. Um, 18 Saudi citizens are reportedly under investigation for his death, and Deputy Chief of Saudi Intelligence, a royal court advisor, has been fired. Uh, so the uh so uh let's see after the saudis acknowledged kasogi's death trump continued to stand by them saying he found their explanation about how he died credible and offering his support to the crown prince and told reporters on monday that he wasn't satisfied with what he'd heard from the saudis about kasogi's death so it, nothing consistent from trump any any time he likes somebody which is usually a despot uh he he's he's never tough on him it's it's the total opposite of uh, Barack Obama. He <laughs> 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 was tough on everybody. Oh, yeah. So tough. Very tough. Uh, Erdogan, uh, you know, I'll have more flexibility after the midterms. Tell uh, Putin. Erdogan on Tuesday contradicted Saudi Arabia's narrative, uh, describing it as a premeditated act, said it was planned and called for 18 men arrested. And uh, Trump said this was the worst cover-up ever, and he wanted uh, them to investigate. Now... Uh, this was October 21st uh, on Minister Saudi Foreign Minister Abdel Al Jubir. There was obviously a tremendous mistake, he says. Just a, an accident. So he's on Brett Baer's program, uh, and he, here he is on, uh, on Fox News. You're an authoritarian government. Um, you're saying that the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, did not know about this? at all, even though there are members of this 15-person team that are closely aligned with him? 
Well, Brett, uh, first of all, we're not an authoritarian government. We're a monarchy. We have our checks and balances. We have our systems. The individuals uh, who did this did this outside the scope of their authority. There obviously was a tremendous mistake made, and what compounded the mistake was the attempt to try to cover up. That is unacceptable in any government. These things, unfortunately, happen. We want to make sure that those who are responsible are punished, and we want to make sure that we have procedures in place that prevent it from happening again. Our history as Saudi Arabia for the past 18 years, 80 plus years since the founding of the modern Saudi state, we have never engaged in such behavior, and we will never engage in such behavior. This is an aberration, this is a mistake, this is a criminal act, and those responsible for it will be punished. All right. <clears throat> so that is all the information. So now you kind of know everything. Mm -hmm. All right. You know everything about this case. Um, and so what are we supposed to do with it? Know it, I think, first and foremost. Why does it matter? I think it matters because we are deeply entangled into uh, the affairs of a country that is a brutal dictatorship. Yes. Do I think that they intentionally killed him? I don't know. You know, if you believe the Turks and you believe what they say about this tape, uh, they cut off his fingers. All right, maybe that maybe, maybe they were trying to redition him. You believe the Saudis, okay? This Saudi uh, foreign minister says, you know, it it was a mistake. It, the cover up made it worse. This is just terrible. You know what? The, what they're now what the Saudis are now saying, which they've not been truthful the entire time. It's been a shifting story. You know, it's just a rendition gone wrong. You know, we were trying to bring him back, and then these guys screwed up and they killed him. Ah, nuts. Dang. You know, and the Turks are saying, no, you intentionally killed him. You, it was premeditated murder. Does it really matter? I don't think it really matters. It doesn't really matter. Uh, they, they intended to harm the guy. Right. They intended to take him back and put him and make him a political prisoner. Correct. If their version of the truth is, is real. He could still be in Saudi Arabia prison we still won't know either we don't know because they still haven't shown a body i i honestly think uh they would have shown him by now maybe should we cut off funding to the saudi arabians yeah yeah <laughs> yes yes should we stop selling arms to the saudi arabians yeah, the u.s government and you let a private business do it no want. we should stop selling oh. weapons to the saudi arabians yes oh sorry, sorry. but, but we'll lose said. american jobs oh i'm sorry those American jobs are con uh, complicit in the deaths of innocent people in war. Yeah. Yes, we should stop selling arms to them. Because who would we sell these arms nobody. to? Nobody. Oh, nobody. Damn. Sell them to ourselves. Okay, That's which they will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm 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 out on that. Go for a new, good new tank, but it just you know the world's more complex. So you just have to think. No, no oh, more sorry. no more arms sales. We're done with that. Well, there's jobs. Of, I don't care. They, they can go work at Starbucks, too. Yeah, they could do something else. Right. You know. There's apparently a web director job open, opening up tomorrow. That <laughs> <laughs> they <would> do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, there's tons of different things they can do. And like, you know, each of these people are machinish and stuff like that. These jobs translate to other things. Yeah. You know. So uh, our money, our tax money, was used to kill Khashoggi. Yes. So if you're outraged by this death, they probably used an American-made weapon that we sold them. Probably. How's that taste? Hmm? Do you, any, how's it taste? Well, um, I don't really care about taste, usually mouthfeel, but, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. So I, I, I don't I don't think it matters one. You know, you hear all these uh, for Council on Foreign Relations podcasts. What should America do? We need to be leaders in the world. Fawaz. Uh, uh, yeah. What's his name? Uh, the GPS guy that I was talking about earlier. Help me out. GPS guy. Yeah. The CNN guy that I had to watch. Fawaz. What's his face? I want to watch CNN. I'm trying to think of this person. Uh, anyways, the Sunday show, you know, who is the former head of the foreign policy magazine and. You know, uh, he's like, ah, the Americans need to be leaders on this. And unfortunately, they're not leading because Donald Trump says bad things about reporters. Uh, That's so nice. It's hot. I'm sweaty. Feels great. I'm not feeling good, and you're making me sweat. So at the end of the day, we should lead by having a really good economy. And that means doing things, uh, selling things that are peaceful. Mm -hmm. So w do we need to be involved in the investigation? 
frankly, I just don't care. Like, I know that that's really callous. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care. Like, I don't want the Americans to do anything. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't affect America. The less entangling alliances that we have with the Saudi Arabians, the better. Why are you looking at me like that? You just hate American jobs. I guess. They'll do something else. It'll be okay. If we're not bomb, if, if our money is bombing those brown people overseas, <laughs> it's going to be Russian Well, then money. the Russians or Chinese will do it. Okay. It's, it's not moral for me to kill Harry. It's not moral for me to hire to kill someone. It's yeah. not moral for me to hire the neighbor upstairs to come and kill Harry. Yeah. If if we form a coalition of people, let's say all the people in the vicinity, I say, Harry stole something of me. All those in favor of killing Harry, vote I. It doesn't make the morality okay because we voted on it. Is it moral to make the gun in the factory to sell it to someone that you're not going to go murder me, though? Yeah. If you're making the bombs up in Seattle that you know are going to kill you many children... You should probably find another job because you're a despicable person. Yeah. How's that taste? Like hmm? I said, it's not about taste, it's about mouthfeel. <laughs> All right. Let's wrap this up. Final thoughts, Harry. Um, I, I we should have let you talk some tonight. I'm sorry. Well, I think there was a huge lack of talking about the mouthfeel. <laughs> <laughs> but enough about your honeymoon, hey. Um, but no. On a serious nature, uh, uh, the hocus pocus thing really does like frustrate me because it's it is trying to stop this arms deal, focusing on one death that it matters. But there's you know the, like I said, the scales tip always the different direction, and this is not the only arms deal the United States government does. You know, uh, it's it's just like and I think the. The Trump letting out about the cover up, yeah, she's completely right about that. You know, right. governments do this all the time. We seen, we saw Putin do this. Uh, I'm sure the you know like the, the British government has done it before. They act like they haven't. They're liars. You know, all if you know where the bodies are ba buried and you, you go away and start popping your mouth off, someone's going to probably put you. You know, uh, he has balls. He had balls. I'll say that. Yeah, I mean, knowing knowing exactly what they could do to him, and probably would. He had balls. Oh yeah, I give it to him, and I appreciate everything he said. But, but you know, it's um, is it the same thing as like that's why I saw as you know, give to the the idea that you know, she's, I think who whoever is Satoshi, whoever she is, she is probably dead because no one can keep a secret that long. Right. The creator of Bitcoin. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. We just gotta explain it for the people. Yeah, that's why I said I was like, you know, it's got to be that, you know, because, you know, how many people keep that secret? You've seen all these people use it. Keep your mouth shut. Right. Unless it is one person that knows how to keep their mouth shut. All right. My final thoughts are to thank Craig DaCosta, Jason Doolittle, Christy Avery, and the Liberty Coalition for their support of $100 a month per episode. You guys are awesome. All of our Patreon people are awesome. You guys keep uh, independent media supported. We appreciate all of your efforts so much. Um, we are very excited about everything that's going on at We Are Libertarians. We've got a lot of people working hard on this. And uh, all we ask is that you chip in $5, 10 25 $100, even a dollar. That helps. All of that helps. And uh, share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share it while you still can. Share this podcast if you at any point during this podcast said wow that's a really good point i i think differently now or i learned something then share that and say hey i learned something about this thing while listening to this podcast you got to do that you got to share it and uh especially on you know twitter and facebook that's where everybody's at instagram if you listen on spotify you can now directly post to spot you know we're, we're on spotify you can directly post to instagram stories instagram stories is a great way to promote the show Tag us. Go follow us on Instagram. Follow us on YouTube. Um, we're trying to get to a thousand so we can monetize up to a hundred dollars, so I can get that twenty-one dollars in revenue we still have. Uh, so please go like the uh, the page, and uh, obviously the Twitch. Yeah. Is there Twitch. still live streaming happening there, or uh, you give up? I stream on there when I just do some games. I apologize. I need to get on more often. Well, I now am... you're threatening to quit, so. <sighs> Not threaten. I'm just saying it's on the table, okay? And I didn't threaten, and I'm saying it's a possibility. 
things have happened. But I am getting the studio, the basement studio, back back in um, back in function. Got the bore hooked back up. It still works. You know, pulled that back out. All right. Um, getting things cleaned up. Getting the I uh, redid all the light bulbs and got the lighting down there again. So. Yeah, um, I think, and I'm doing the last improvement on the outside of the house so the basement stops leaking all the way, thanks to Aaron Ewer. Just a little closing music for you. Oh, are you, are you, am I getting wrapped up? Am I getting wrapped up? It's like the Emmys. <laughs> but yeah, so like hopefully, you know, get the studio finished probably in two weeks. All right, very good. We'll look forward to more Harry. He'll be here every Tuesday night. No matter what. <laughs> Those are his, his instructions. Thanks to everybody that listens. Uh, hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you enjoy this show. Hopefully you enjoy listening. We appreciate when you write in at editor at weirdlibertarians.com on the comment or question. Uh, do you have a question about libertarianism? Uh, what's what's like the what's the subject? We're going to do an episode on this. So send in a question. What is the thing that you really are like, I just can't get past this to become a full libertarian? Like mine's private courts. Send in your uh, send in your thing at editor at weirdlibertarians.com, and we will see you tomorrow. Is that your anarchist one?